hello, I'm Fraser. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, this is a talk about what, it's, what life is like as a remotee or a quasi-remotee. I'll explain um, a bit more about myself and my work situation shortly. But first, we need to answer the question, what is remote work, aka telecommuting? And there's probably half a dozen other names for it. So, um, it really is a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you have arrangements where maybe um, you work in an office in the city where you live, and uh, perhaps you work from home, you know, two days a week, something like that. And I'm not really talking about that situation uh, in my presentation today, although some of what I cover will apply. What I'm really talking about is a work situation where the people with whom you work most closely on the projects you work on uh, are in another city, maybe even the other side of the world, so you don't actually have the opportunity to go and work with your immediate colleagues uh, on whatever project it is you're working on. Um, I assume most, are most people in the room in software or technology? I think so. Is anyone not in software specifically? No? Okay, cool. That's good. Um, so, yeah, remote work is probably more common in the software industry than, than most other industries, although some other industries are, are starting to catch up. Um, it's an increasingly common option. And, uh, yeah, as I said, it's a spectrum, so you've got um, yeah, arrangements where maybe you work from home a little bit, um, but my situation is basically the opposite of that. So, <laughs> um, although there is an asterisk, which I'll, I'll talk about as well. So I'm in Australia, I live here in Brisbane, uh, and I work on projects based in uh, the Czech Republic and in, uh, in the States, in Mountain View, California. So that's sort of where the two projects that I work on are based. And when I say I work on two projects, I actually work on integration work between the two projects. So my time is divided pretty much 50-50 um, between the project that's based in Europe and the project that's based in the States. And most of the time I'm focusing mainly on one or mainly on the other. Um, if you're interested to know, these are identity management and public key infrastructure projects. Uh, so like security software, uh, I'm not really going to talk about that at all, but if you're interested in that, uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day, so that'd be cool if you want to come and ask me about that. Um, so yeah, I work in Australia, everyone else is in Europe or the States, but it's even a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of other remotees working on these projects, um, but they also are based around Europe and in the States. And both of those projects have remote workers. So I'll talk about some of the challenges um, about this work situation in a little bit. The asterisk I mentioned is that um, Red Hat does actually have an office here in Brisbane, and uh, I have a desk there, and some days I even go in and brush the cobwebs away and sit down and do some work at my desk. Uh, so when I'm talking about remote work, what I'm really talking about is when you are geographically or temporarily separated from the project that you're working on. So this could in fact entail going to the city and working in an office with other people who also work for the same company. It could, in, uh, could cover sort of co-working situations where you and um, a bunch of other people at a different company or the same company work together in the same office. Or um, you know, maybe you go down to the edge um, at the state library and, and work there with other people in a similar situation. So I'm definitely not talking about a situation where you're necessarily cloistered um, in your home uh, doing the work, but uh, yeah, definitely uh, what I'm talking about is a situation where um, all, you, where you basically you don't have the opportunity to go and meet face to face with people on a regular basis who are working with you on the same project. So how does it actually work? Um, obviously communication is very important and uh, 
direct communication through email uh, and mailing lists, especially at Red Hat. Not all companies would necessarily use mailing lists the way we do at Red Hat, but uh, email is a hugely important part of uh, part of the communication mix for uh, sort of less offline communication. There's chat protocols like uh, IRC or Slack, which we don't really use at Red Hat um, in the engineering division, but a lot of engineering teams are using that, and maybe there's other protocols um, that are used. For me personally, um, I do chat to my colleagues on IRC, but um, there's not a lot of overlap in terms of the time zone when I'm working most of the time and the time zones where they work, so I don't spend a lot of time um, talking directly to colleagues. Collaborative documents are really important, so you know, Google Docs, wikis, um, these sorts of uh, systems where you can collaboratively edit um, documents, information uh, with other people um, are a big part of, of how our team communicates information, particularly more detailed technical information. And meetings still happen. Um, for me, well, based on the, where the projects I work on are based, when are they going to have meetings? It's going to be in the overlap between Europe and US time zones, which for me is literally the middle of the night. Um, modulo daylight savings, um, which is a, a whole other bag of hurt. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, meetings do happen. I, in my work situation, normally don't have to show up in the middle of the night for a meeting, but sometimes I do. Um, and I just have to wear that. That's part of my work arrangement. Um, if you are a remotee working um, for a company, if you're, base, if you're living in Brisbane and the company you work for is in Sydney or even in Perth or something, that's not too bad because they're not asking you to be up in the middle of the night. But um, you know, in this increasingly you know, sort of global um, communicating world where it's now possible and increasingly common for someone working in Australia to work for a company based in San Francisco or Zurich or anywhere, um, then yeah, sometimes you'll have to wear being up at the middle of the night to participate in meetings or get things done. But before we get to what's tough uh, and, and what stinks about being a remote worker and talk about some of the joys. So the biggest one is flexibility. Um, for me, in my work situation, I have so much flexibility. Um, I can basically get up when I want, um, you know, do my work when I want. If I need to run errands, I can go run errands. Um, you know, if I want to work late because I'm feeling productive and uh, sort of I'm in flow and I'm on a roll, I can just work late and then sleep until midday the next day. You know, if I need to stay up um, to get things done, to communicate with colleagues, or if I need to get up super early, it means that I can you know, sleep in the next day, or alternatively, um, if I'm working with guys in the US, I might be up really early and I can knock off at two o'clock. So you have a lot of flexibility um, as a remotee. If you're in a situation like, and I'll just use Brisbane and Sydney as an example, you know, living in Brisbane, working in Sydney, or vice versa, um, you're not going to have as much flexibility because there would be an expectation that um, you're going to be working at the same time as the other people because the time zone is not different or not very different. So once again, as in most things in this talk, there really is a, a spectrum of experiences that are possible as a remotee, but certainly in my situation and in, and in any situation where um, you know, you're working with people based overseas, you can expect that you'll have a lot of flexibility, and that's great. Um, convenience um, is another benefit of being a remotee. Um, this is my work environment at home. So as I said, I do have a, a desk at the Brisbane office, um, Red Hat's Brisbane office, where I can go and work, but most days I work from home. So my commute most days is uh, you know, from the bedroom to my den, via the kitchen and the bathroom. So, yeah, that takes 10 minutes and I can just sit down and start working. 
Uh, so it's incredibly convenient. You don't have to spend time you know, sitting on a bus or stuck in traffic. You don't have to wear the costs uh, associated with a daily commute. Um, so time costs, monetary costs, and we all know public transport in, in Brisbane is pretty horrendously expensive. You know, I live at Holland Park, but sorry for people who aren't in Brisbane, just an anecdote. I live in Holland Park, which is about 10 minutes south of the city by car, and to get a bus in last night, and my wife had taken my go card, so I had to pay cash at $6.30 just to travel what takes 10 minutes in a car. Crazy. So I don't have to do that. I do go into the office regularly, you know, normally once a week, so that's fine. But um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of financial and time saving benefits and a lot of convenience um, if you have a remote work arrangement where you can work from home a lot. Um, also, something to mention here is that there may be tax benefits. Um, you know, I'm not your tax advisor, um, and certainly if you are um, thinking about doing remote work uh, from home, you should probably speak to one to, uh, to see what's possible. But if you are using your home internet connection, your home power, um, and you know, paying the bills for those utilities, um, and you're using those uh, in the course of income generating activities, then there's usually a tax deduction uh, available for those things. So that's certainly something to consider and to keep in mind um, if you are thinking about remote work or find yourself in a remote work situation. Uh, flow, or you might equally put productivity here. So we talk about this idea of flow where you just get into a, a very um, productive state of mind and you sort of get on a roll. And uh, as a remotee, it can be easier to, to get in flow and become um, very productive just due to a lack of distractions and your ability to control your work environment much more than if you're in an office with a bunch of other people doing their own work um, or creating whatever distractions they may create. Um, this, of course, can go both ways because uh, even though you have more control, you don't have complete control. I've had days working from home uh, where literally across the street, outside the window that you saw in the picture a slide or two ago, the house was being demolished. Uh, I didn't get a lot of work done that day. That was very difficult. Um, they were jackhammering um, on the same property a few weeks ago. Uh, that was a tough day. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have the option of just picking up and going to the office if it's looking like those sort of environmental concerns are going to cause problems um, for my productivity. Or alternatively, you can go to a library, uh, go to a cafe, whatever. If you've got that flexibility, then the options are there. But yeah, as a general rule, if you control, um, if, the more control you have over your work environment, the easier it is um, to avoid uh, distractions and uh, become much more productive. As a remotee, you may have the opportunity to travel more than you otherwise would. So, uh, on, on my part, in my experience, I've had the opportunity to travel um, both to a lot of conferences um, as basically kind of the Australia Pacific or Asia Pacific representative of my team and uh, teams and the work we're doing. Um, so, you know, Red Hat sees the value in. Um, getting their engineers to conferences to learn as well as to um, promote what our team is doing and the projects that we're working on uh, and, and the value that we can bring to, to businesses and organisations uh, through the work that we're doing. Um, so I've, I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel uh, quite a bit to, to, com to conferences or to other Red Hat events. Uh, and I've also had the opportunity to travel to Europe uh, to meet the team over there uh, and attend a conference. Um, this is absolutely not a given. Uh, some companies, if, if they have remote work arrangements, might not give you the opportunity to travel, but I think most would um, to a degree. Uh, if you're in IT slash software and you're looking at remote work or you know, opportunities to travel through your work, uh, there's a pretty good chance you might be seeing that view 
outside your plane window. Uh, so, those are some of the benefits of being a remotee. Um, but of course, it's not all roses. Um, and a lot of the points that I've covered, of course, have their flip side as well. So, there's the work-life balance. So, when you're working from home, or when you have a lot of flexibility, um, you know, allowing you to sort of break down or have broken down a separation between your work life and your life life or your home life slash friends slash whatever, um, it can be very difficult to, to keep a clear separation there. Uh, I find this quite challenging a lot of the time, especially uh, with a young child. Um, and working from home a lot, there are a lot of sort of household demands um, that are... Um, it's not difficult, but you really do have to put boundaries in place to make sure that you are able to do your work, that you're able to be productive um, in an environment where without those clear boundaries and uh, you know, without clear management of expectations of other people um, would basically destroy your productivity, uh, which is a very bad thing, because otherwise what are they paying you for? So work-life balance um, can be tough. It's manageable, but you have to be the sort of person who can put in boundaries and just say, right, you know, I'm going to work from this time to this time. That's my work time. Um, or alternatively, um, allow for some flexibility, but be aware that if you're going to allow for that flexibility, it might mean that you've got to then put in more hours later on to get the work done late at night or something like that. So that's, that's how it is for me. Basically, when I'm working from home, um, the boundaries are there. You know, my wife knows if I'm working, I'm not to be interrupted unless it's an emergency. But when I get up to take a break or have lunch, you know, if you want to ask me to do things then, that's a great time. And whatever time I lose during the day, I'll just make up after the baby's in bed and after we've had dinner. Onboarding uh, as a remote worker can be extremely challenging. Uh, this for me was, I think, the greatest challenge uh, of sort of entering my work situation. So I hadn't been a remote worker prior to joining Red Hat. Um, there was no one on the same team to sort of get me uh, up to speed on the project, to answer all of my beginner questions, and sort of get me feeling like I was a productive contributor um, to the project. And uh, I came very close to quitting within my first three months because uh, I did indeed find this challenging. Um, but if you persist, if you communicate openly, if you use the uh, channels of communication that are available to you to get in touch with team members, you've just got to keep asking questions, ask for support if you need support, and you can get through it. And eventually, there's a moment when you realise, you know, this is great, I feel like a... Um, you know, good contributor to the project. Um, I feel like I'm productive and I feel like I am, you know, becoming a subject matter expert in, in such and such an area that is your area of focus. Um, and the point when other people on the team start coming and asking you questions about what they perceive to be your area of expertise is very gratifying because you know that you've had a, a difficult road to get there. So it can be very rewarding once you've been through that, that onboarding phase and you suddenly start getting the feedback about your contribution or about the value of your expertise to the team. It's very rewarding, um, but it's a challenge. So if you ever enter remote work for the first time, or indeed every time you onboard at a new place, you have to be prepared for that challenge. Communication can be very difficult, um, particularly if you're like me, out in your own time zone, and email is the primary method of communication. It's very easy to ignore an email. Um, if you look at it from the flip side too, even though there are a lot of remotees um, on these projects, so they're all in Europe or in the States on the other project, um, so they still have people in the same time zone that they can rely upon to get a quick answer. Uh, so, on my part, I have no choice but to rely on other people sometimes 
to get the information I need to do my job or to get them, you know, to do some job for me that I need done so that my work is unblocked and I can move forward. Uh, but they don't have to rely on me. They all sort of have each other around themselves. So it, it can feel a bit one-sided like that. Uh, it's just part of the challenge. You just have to be persistent, communicate clearly and openly, um, and escalate um, to your manager if need be, which I have had to do once or twice. So you just got to be aware that that option's there, um, and if you need to do it, you've got to pull the trigger. Um, so it's, uh, it's good to talk about uh, what's actually in it for an employer, because um, you yourself, at some future point in your career, might um, be in a position to decide, well, should we hire this person as a remote worker or not? So some of the benefits are, of course, access to the talent wherever the talent is, or maybe um, the people with the skills that you need are, um, you know, stay-at-home parents or are uh, disabled or um, in some other way disadvantaged or unable to sort of move or attend an office to work. So you do really open up a... Uh, a greater pool of potential talent if you accept remote workers. There have also been a lot of studies that have shown that uh, remote workers are happier and have sort of a lower intention to, um, to leave a job. So um, whether that's because they're remote workers or not, it's not really clear, but there is a strong correlation there. And uh, there's also potentially um, tax benefits for businesses, or uh, lower overheads, of course, because you don't necessarily have to um, give them you know, office space and pay for the electricity for their computer, um, pay for equipment that they're going to use at the office, chairs and so on. So lower overheads um, for businesses, of course, is another benefit. And uh, the potential for better work-life balances for the employees and that they're not having to spend you know, long periods of time commuting every day Happier employees make for more productive employees, as a general rule. Uh, so is remoting for you? Well, I can't answer that question. Um, it's a question that many of you will uh, have to answer at some point in your careers. Um, I would say that it's not always going to be a yes or always going to be a no. As your sort of life progresses and your career progresses, you may have different feelings about you know, whether remoting is a good option for you at different points in your life. Early in your career, perhaps not so much, and it's probably important to consider the, uh, the value of having a mentor or having people alongside you who you can ask questions. So perhaps early in your career, um, it might not necessarily be the best idea later on, or as you start a family or whatever, um, then you might definitely see a lot more value in it for me um, with, the, with the joys and the challenges of my work situation, having a young child. Right now, I would not trade the convenience um, that my job gives me very lightly at all. Um, but I also feel like I don't want to have my current work arrangement indefinitely. So, you know, your attitude towards remote work will likely change over time. The other important thing is that, of course, you have to be an internally motivated person. Um, you have to be able to be uh, um, you know, productive as, a, as an autonomous person without people sort of around you pushing forward in the same direction all the time. Some people uh, don't cope with that, um, that freedom or that lack of structure very well. And that's OK. It just means that maybe remoting is not the best option for you. Um, so these are just things to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to remember is that it can be very hard to know, um, you know whether the amount of effort that you're putting in or um, what you're delivering is sort of up to expectations or not. But again, it just comes down to communication. Um, if you need uh, reassurance or you feel like you need to be um, perhaps challenged in that area, um, you need only talk to other people in your team or ask your manager. So landing the gig, how do you actually become a remotee? Um, for my part, it was um, knowing someone working in a similar area within Red Hat 
um, who was aware of my skills and, and where my interests lay. Um, he got wind of the role that I currently have uh, opening up and referred me. And that may be the story for a lot of you as well. Um, a lot of job boards will, or job ads will say, you know, must be on site or alternatively, you know, remote workers you know, are acceptable for this job. Um, if they don't say anything or even if they do say the job is on site but the job really appeals to you and you want to look at being a remote worker for that role, just apply anyway because often if the skill set is right and if they think you're a good fit for the team and for the role, then they'll make it happen. Um, and finally, go to conferences, um, talk at conferences, talk to people at conferences. Um, it's a great opportunity to meet people working for interesting companies uh, outside your city, um, you know, elsewhere in Australia or abroad. So going and meeting people uh, face to face, talking about the different roles and um, getting to know what opportunities are out there at other companies is a, is a great way for these opportunities to open up. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to say. I hope there's time for one or two questions. Uh, yep, great. So thanks for listening, and if you have questions, fire away. Thanks, Clinton. Um, that's a really good question. So the question was, um, for the benefit of the recording and anyone who didn't hear, um, is there any advantage for me, given I don't work directly with anyone in the Brisbane office, to actually going to the Brisbane office? Um, so the answer is yes, um, in a number of ways. Um, the first and most important way is cake day, of course. Uh, <laughs> So you go in for cake day once a month. No, no um, that's actually that is a pretty good perk, but that's not the best perk. Um, so Red Hat have a lot of different people in a lot of different roles. Um, the Brisbane office is basically a microcosm of the whole company. So we have engineering, um, sales, support, um, internal IT, um, security, um, security engineers. So it's basically everything that happens in Red Hat happens in the Brisbane office. So. I can add value to the organisation, for example, by going and giving presentations or advice um, to um, people who are working in support or in sales, and I do that periodically. It's a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, and the other thing is that I can bring value to my team through talking to them and hearing about their challenges and experiences um, with the products that I work on. Uh, the other thing is there's also a social side which is a benefit to being what I call a quasi-remotee, so working remote with respect to the project, but actually having an office and, and people working for the same company that I can go and meet and talk to and hang out with. So there is, there is that social side and you know, catching up with people um, who aren't on the same project, but you get along with them and you want to go and have a chat. Um, so that's a benefit as well. Um, yeah, so like, there's not much point in me being on IRC for engineering um, if I'm working a normal day. If I need to talk to someone, um, you know, given it's me and then a whole bunch of people in Europe or the States, I have to wear that, and that's just part of my work situation. Um, but for less, um, for less urgent or less imperative um, communication needs, then just email is our main method of communication. So usually it's like a you know, 20 hour round trip or something, you know, 16 hour round trip. I could fire off an email at the end of the day um, to someone you know, if, I, if I need some information from them. And then hopefully when I come and start work the next morning, I'm gonna have a reply and um, hopefully it's gonna tell me what I need to know. Um, so often that's fine if things aren't urgent. If they're urgent, in my work situation, I just have to wear it and 
stay up late or get up early and get in touch with the people directly um, you know, with whom I, I need to talk. Yep. Sorry, I have a question to understand this. Why actually work in front of a similar situation? Um, you kind of need to pre understand work or rainy days when you don't have enough to do. So, yeah, that's something else that we both have to do. Yeah. Um, so just to repeat in case anyone didn't hear, yeah, it's good to have sort of a lot of, well not a lot, but at least a few different things that you can work on. So if you do get blocked in something and are relying on someone else to move forward, you can just switch to a different activity and, and push forward in, you know, on a different task that you have. I think that's similar with most, job, most jobs, but it's, it's quite important in a situation where if you're unblocked and you can't get unblocked for 24 hours, well, what are you going to do? Just sit there? What are they paying you for? You've got to have something else to do. Okay, thanks very That's much. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much, President.